My name is Jessica Fulton, and I'm the Vice President of Policy at the Joint Center for Political and Economic Studies. Um, I am really excited to be here. I think uh, the idea of being able to just like talk to smart folks about economic policy is probably like one of the most exciting parts of my job. Uh, so I'm really excited about the folks that we have here today. Um, we're joined today by our esteemed panelists, Dr. Seth Hunter, Director of Black-Led Organizing and Power Building at Center for Community Change, uh, uh, Angela Hanks, the Chief of Programs at Demos, and Dr. Alex Commerdale, Director of Workforce Policy at the Joint Center. We will also be joined shortly by Natalie Cofield. She is, uh, she is on her way right now. She is the former Assistant Administrator at the U.S. Small Business Administration. Um, can you all help me welcome our panelists? So we're going to jump right in because we don't have that much time and I really want to hear from everybody that's uh, uh, here today. And I'm going to start with my colleague, Dr. Alex Carmadale. Alex, the Joint Center is heavily invested in identifying and promoting economic policies that support black communities. But the fields we work in often lack voices that represent black communities. Could you share your perspective on the importance of entering these conversations with an eye towards equity and towards advancing black communities specifically? Yep. Um, so I know, uh, ooh, that sounds really loud. Um, voice of God over here. Um, so I'm uh, Alex again, and I direct our workforce policy program at the Joint Center, like was mentioned. And I, whenever I first started at the Joint Center, I would describe my job as simply like putting black folks at the center of policy debates concerning the future of work, workforce development, and job quality. Like if I had to summarize like what we do in this work, like that's what I'm trying to do. And the reason why I've been so motivated, myself and my team, uh, Justin Nally, Brian Kennedy, uh, we've been so motivated to do that because historically black communities have not been at the center of those debates. Um, it's mostly been, you know, white-led institutions who have been developing economic policies that have broad implications, um, but also inequitable implications for uh, communities of color. So um, I'm really privileged, I think, to do that work at the Joint Center. I think as an institution itself, the Joint Center takes up a really important role in prioritizing black communities in these debates currently um, and historically because we are seeing and we move forward and progress over multiple economic uh, events, downturns, pandemic-driven recessions, and otherwise that black folks are still being left out of those conversations in the halls of Congress and you know, across the administration, but that's not even getting into the ways that they are excluded um, in our analysis and our policy making across states at the state level and otherwise. So, um, these, you know, we're in a period of time where economically black communities are still experiencing stark disparities regarding their participation in the labor market. We've not had an economically inclusive recovery despite, you know, some of the popular discourse. Um, really proud and, and, and should celebrate a lot of the gains that have been made, um, particularly for workers and for learners. Um, but we also should not settle with returning to where we were before the pandemic. Just returning to January 2020 or February 2020 is, is unacceptable. And I think that's also something that we've been trying to keep front and center, that we imagine kind of a different world where we have completely like redressed the systems and the issues that cause black communities to have twice the unemployment rate of uh, white men, right? Or we've redressed the cause of the pay inequities in this country that disproportionately affect um, black folks, in particular black women. Um, so those are, this, this, the way that I'm even communicating it right now is, you know, not the common, you know, discourse that you hear in the halls of, you know, in the policy making process, right? Um, it's very much still race neutral. We don't disaggregate the data across the board. Um, if we do, then we're only looking at participation and representation through the lens of diversity. We're not looking at the disaggregating the outcomes, what happens to folks who pass through programs or who are affected by certain policies through a racial and ethnic equity inclusion lens. So, um, so yeah, these are these are you know. This is the priority of, of, of our work. You know, we're helping, I think, you know, and, and not 
I hope she won't be modest, but you know, in addition to being our VP of policy, you know, Jessica's also leading our economic policy work, and you know, with that support, we are thinking about reframing the narrative of the economy um, here um, so that it does consider the unique uh, experiences of, of, of black folks. I will say this too before I um, pivot because I know we've got little pockets of time. But um, the what's unique and what I appreciate so much is that core to like our anti-racist approach to developing like policy solutions for black communities is listening to black communities. And in the workforce policy program, we spent you know at least the last 18 months organizing focus groups, conducting surveys, compensating participants, bringing them to the table and asking them, what is the world that you wanna see? And we're working towards making sure that those reflections, those solutions are a component of the the systems change work, right? It's a part of our research, but also reflected in the actual, like the bill text, if I wanted to make it more clear. So um, I, I would say I, I'd be remiss if I don't mention that our methodology at the Joint Center is fairly unique. Um, and one that I appreciate because I don't think we could like move towards the full freedom of black people, which is part of our mission at the Joint Center, if we're not continuously talking to black people. So I'll stop there. Yeah, that um, is really helpful for where I want to go with the conversation. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So Dr. Hunter, Community Change devotes significant resources to organizing in partnership with black community leaders. Why is this work so critical to policy change? What are the kinds of economic policy related issues the leaders you work with have raised? Yes, yes. Um, so appreciate the invitation. Really glad to be here. Um, yeah, SEFT uh, with Community Change, um, Community Change, similar to the Joint Center, was founded. I think Joint Center was founded in 1970, Community Change in 1968. Um, really born out of a struggle, right? Born out of protests after the assassination of Robert Kennedy and Martin Luther King. Um, organization has been deeply focused on um, racial and economic justice over the last uh, 50 years, and in in part, it still remains our focus. Um, so we are organizers, right? So we are folks that are on the front line. The community change engages organizations all across the country. We build capacity in those organizations by resourcing those organizations to build power in two different ways. Um, first, by building narrative power. So as um, Dr. Alex uh, raised, really kind of creating the conditions where black voices can be the center of our conversations. And we know that that actually is, is uh, still remains an aspect um, not, not the reality that, that, that it needs to be. In part, um, at this very moment, just 30 days out, uh, about 23 or so days out from the midterm election, we have millions of folks all around the country right now knocking on doors, having conversations with black folks in their communities, outside of grocery stores, you know, and other community gatherings. And in part, um, what, what happens in those conversations is folks actually share their aspirations. In many ways, they point to how, um, how sometimes um, democratic participation has not been a reliable vehicle by which we've been able to realize our economic aspirations as black people, right? So these conversations can be challenging. So we are calling folks into this moment to say that your presence, your voice, your vote is critical. And at the same time, we can't actually guarantee that the things that, that we're calling people, the reasons why we're calling people in, our ability to actually deliver on that. And so in many ways that we have to actually face head on the kind of fractured that exists in the social contract, right? The idea that participation actually leads to um, really kind of material change in our lives, that does not exist. And in some ways, in many ways, it makes our work especially challenging as it, as it pertains to cycle after cycle, calling black women in to this democracy and saying, okay, just this time we need your participation, right? And in ways that we cannot say that that participation is gonna lead to you being able to afford the grocery bill, being able to um, see the doctor when you get sick, being able to experience the dignity of what that actually means. And so that is the challenge that we face. So in those conversations, Jessica, directly to your question, what are folks telling us? They're telling us that they want to be able to get, some, get access to trade programs and a college education that doesn't lead us bankrupt for the rest of our lives. They're telling us that they need reliable to, um, access to health care. They're telling us that they need um, access to reproductive 
of justice. They're telling us that they need to be able to participate in our economic systems, not to just to see our hopes, our hopes dash cycle after cycle. So really practical things, right? The very things that um, folks in this room are interested in are the things that we're actually hearing from folks all across the country. Thank you. Um, I feel like I wanted to clap for that. <laughs> Thank you so much, Seth. Angela, you recently transitioned from a role in the Biden-Harris administration, and I'm going to let you talk a little bit about what you did, but what were some of the key initiatives in the administration focused on improving access to good jobs for black workers? Thanks, Jessica. Can you all hear me? It's a little, it's a little low. Why don't we train this one? So, this one real. Okay. Yeah. So, we'll just share. <laughs> All right, good afternoon. Uh, so I'm uh, Angela Hanks. I uh, am newly the Chief of program at Programs at Demos. I started in July. Um, and just before that, uh, as Jessica said, uh, I was with the Biden-Harris administration working at the Department of Labor as the Acting Assistant Secretary of Employment and Training. Um, so I can talk a little bit about sort of administration-wide, but I am really excited to talk about some of the DOL specific and then what I think it means for uh, some of our work as someone who's now kind of uh, newly back on the outside, right? Um, so in in terms of the administration, I think you all know um, we are still in, I think, a moment of evolution as a country when it comes to actually thinking about race and our policies, right? Like that is something that is relatively new in the policy space generally, but I think um, presidential administrations are no exception to that. And so, you know, I say all the things I say knowing that we are in the very first steps of what uh, should not be a long journey but has been. So uh, the administration uh, coming in uh, in 2021, uh, the president signed an executive order on racial equity uh, that I can say at the Department of Labor um, really was a grounding for much of the work that we did. I was really fortunate at the department to have leadership there um, who encouraged us and challenged us always as an organization, as an agency, to center black workers in our work. Um, I think it's pretty rare in federal government to hear those words uttered, especially by folks in leadership, especially by folks in political positions, um, but that was the mandate that we were given uh, across all of our agencies. I can tell you as someone who came in and wanted to do that anyway, it was a nice <laughs> uh, affirmation of the work that, that we'd hoped to do, but um, it did help, I think, set the tone for, for what we might do. Um, certainly in the department, but I think across the administration as well. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about some of the initiatives that came out of that um, and that are ongoing. So one, uh, I, a colleague of mine uh, is now running this initiative called the Good Jobs Initiative at the Department of Labor. Um, and there was a theory behind this initiative. Um, at the time that it was created, there was uh, potential for a lot of federal dollars to go out the door with Build Back Better, um, the infrastructure law, um, you know, obviously Build Back Better became Inflation Reduction Act. It's quite different, but um, the idea was that we can't let these dollars go out the door without ensuring that they are going to the communities most in need and ensuring that they are going to communities who are already marginalized. And so um, part of what uh, my colleagues and I were hoping to do with that work is to make sure that as the folks who are focused on what it means to have a good job and what a good job entails and how to have a safe workplace and uh, know your rights on the job, have decent wages, um, we have some core expertise that we can provide even to our partners in federal government. Um, so the Department of Labor wasn't a recipient of uh, you know the big infrastructure dollars, but through the Good Jobs Initiative, we've been able to uh, really create some strong partnerships with the agencies that are implementing the law with that goal of creating good jobs for workers who are marginalized. So that is, I think, one of the um, ways that a small agency was able to, to leverage its power um, on behalf of black workers to, to support good jobs. Um, something that was specific to my agency that um, is ongoing is, um, you know, Department of Labor is small, but we give out um, in ETA about $10 billion a year uh, in federal grants. So it's it's not a small chunk of change. Um, but, you know, there are a lot of challenges with the way that our grant making is done um, for a variety of reasons that I can get into. Like, um, we frankly, like, are not really set up to make sure that there are new entrants in the door. Um, you know, we have a pretty rigid grant-making system, um, and frankly, hadn't done some of the listening that Alex is talking about um, when it comes to how we structure our grants in order to make them accessible, um, particularly to communities of color. And so one of the things that we did uh, 
the beginning of last year was um, just do some listening sessions with uh, groups who uh, may not have gotten their grants in the past, um, may have gotten them but not consistently, to talk about their experience with the process. Like, what are the things that we can do as an agency? Oh, yeah. Could I, could I ask you to explain what your grants are for? Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so we have a number of grants. So we have, um, so they are mostly uh, to support uh, people in employment and training activities. So um, we have uh, most of the funding through our agency goes out uh, to uh, states and then eventually to localities. But we do have some money, about $400 million, that we hold at the federal level that we award directly to uh, states, to community-based organizations, uh, to nonprofits, uh, to help them support people in getting access to, again, with this cycle, I hope, good jobs. Uh, so. Uh, so there is the money that goes out the door to states and locals that we were, were and are focused on ensuring uh, could be used more strategically and thoughtfully, and again, in focusing on, on the communities who are most marginalized. But there's also this money that we have a little bit more control over because it goes directly out from us. So um, from that listening, some of what we did was rethink the way that we did our grants, putting equity at the center um, of our grant making, starting to think about ways that we could address the process itself. Maybe we needed longer time periods for application. Um, for one of the grants that we put out last year, uh, we put out the same application two years in a row, so you could see it a year in advance and then apply for it later and these were all ideas that came from those listening uh, sessions that we did really early on so I'll stop there but I think the, the thing I'll leave you with is like this is unfinished work I don't want to suggest that we um, have sort of fully addressed the inequities in the labor market and even the department and our grants but I think it's a good example of the ways that we can start thinking about how to center black workers in the work that we do um, it's it is possible, it's doable, even in a rigid structure like that. And so it's something that I think I uh, am carrying into my future work and I'm excited to continue working with the folks here uh, to advance. So Alex, um, could you give us a little bit more context of like what, what makes a job a good job for a black worker and, um, and what should policymakers be thinking about as they craft policies to improve access to good jobs? So, um, Angela was talking like she still works at DOL. <laughs> uh, uh, but, you know, what I, but before I answer the, the, the question, I, I just want to highlight um, how um, refreshing it's been to have um, close allies in this, in this administration, um, and even those that you may not even know personally, but just the willingness across the administration, particularly in my work like with DOL, with the Department of Commerce, and a few others, to listen to what but constituents like the Joint Center, but even like everyday working people um, want to see for themselves and for their communities. Um, I think that openness during this time period, who knows what will happen in the future, but right now is a huge window of opportunity that we should not take for, for granted. So in terms of action items, I say let's you know make sure we're putting our solutions front and center right now while we have people who are listening, because we know that that's not always going to be the case. Um, so as far as good jobs are concerned, so um, you know, one of the things that we believe is that every job should be a good job. So I should start there, first and foremost. Um, and unfortunately, all jobs are not good jobs, right? In fact, the vast majority of jobs in this country are not good jobs. Um, and you know, I'm not talking about jobs that are just those that pay poor wages. Um, you could actually earn a family sustaining wage and still go to work and face harassment daily, uh, still face poor working conditions regarding the health and safety of your workplace. Um, so that's the kind of Expanding the definition of a good job does require us to think beyond just the the money part of a job. But I'm not gonna lie, like, you know, black folks like we need a job so we can make money and pay bills. Like that's what it is. We are faced with um, incredible wealth disparities in this country. We need to have income that is uh, that we can uh, apply to savings so that we can save up and support our, our families, but oftentimes even beyond our households, right? Um, 
and, and the jobs right now aren't aren't doing that uh, for the vast majority of black folks in this country who are liquid asset poor or, or are facing uh, kind of the the short end of the stick regarding um, upward mobility in their in their workplace so um, when we think about a good job um, a lot of you know folks I hear talk about good jobs and I should note like there's a lot of job quality conversation happening right now. Um, in fact, there are several really wonderful initiatives coming out of the Department of Labor as well as the Department of Commerce focused specifically on job quality, which um, in, in defining job quality, which I think is very promising and that the Joint Center is actually a, a, a part of um, those, those conversations as well. Um, what they do is, you know, um, what, I've, what I'm concerned about is they minimize the earnings aspect of a good job though, when for black folks that is like a big part of it, right? Like staying afloat, being able to afford to go see a doctor whenever you're sick or pay for groceries, um, it, that is a big part of it. So I think whenever we think about what job quality means to black workers, um, I would say pay parity, you know, family sustaining wages, et cetera, does fall, rise back up to the top of the list. Um, but if you were looking at the aggregate, it's not the number one thing. It's um, schedule flexibility, uh, you know, predictable hours within the workplace, um, the ability to know when you're going to show up to work. I used to work in serving. I used to be a restaurant worker, and I did not know when I was going to be on the schedule until the Friday before the following, the next week. So I could not plan in my life and I did not I was not a caregiver at the time so just add being a caregiver on top of that um, you also have access to benefits as a job quality issue right the ability to have employer sponsored health coverage not just the the presence or the option for employer uh, employer sponsored health coverage but also affordable employer sponsored health coverage because you can have that option but it might take a little bit too much out of your check to actually want to participate in your health options um, that we and we see that be particularly the case for for black workers um, so these are you know kind of general job quality issues but I do want to take a minute to highlight um, a more pointed uh, way to think about job quality. And this is something that we developed in partnership with the National Black Worker Center and several other labor leaders across the country. And it's the Black Worker Bill of Rights. Um, it is forthcoming in terms of an actual document. But I just wanted to talk about a few. Um, for one, it's about the one of the rights is the right to be free from harm within the workplace, right? Um, not free from harm, like always physical harm. We we know that at the height of the pandemic, you know, black folks in communities of color, migrant workers, et cetera, were overrepresented in jobs where the employer had not instituted any health and safety standards to actually protect them from receiving COVID, yet they were the first ones back to work whenever governors decided to lift their shelter in place orders. There were no protections there. So there's the, the right to be free from that type of harm. There's also the right to be free from harm in terms of racial discrimination, you know, racist harassment in the workplace, which is still very rampant across the, the labor market. Um, the right to uh, wages that are owed. You know, we talked earlier today about the, you know, when we had um, the conversation with the EEOC about misclassification and how that leads to lost wages, disproportionately so for black workers. Um, you also, uh, there was a really incredible piece that came out of the New York Times this week by author Tal Smith, who actually documented extensively the current cases that regarding wage theft, um, particularly in the restaurant industry. It's very rampant today. Um, the right to uh, the right to career advancement. Um, you know, when we talk to, to, I mean, I think there's a lot of mixed messages and signaling about higher education, around training and education, things like that. A lot of folks are saying, well, you don't need a college degree, yada, yada, yada. I mean, a lot of the polling actually shows that when you ask black people what they want, they actually prioritize higher learning. They prioritize higher education, despite what some of the dominant discourse to say about communities of color. Um, and they want those opportunities given to them free from being in debt, right? Without the, the debt peonage that comes with a higher education. Um, in fact, um, if I could say, like we did some polling earlier this year that looked at, we were trying to add some context to the, uh, the tuition cancellation debate. 
and in our polling, you know, found that the vast majority of black Americans want to cancel debt, not just those with the debt, right? Like whole black communities do want to have a debt-free society and they don't want their kids to go to college, be saddled with debt, and then uh, not be able to generate wealth for themselves and th their families. So that's another one. And then two more I'll, I'll name, you know, the right to organize. Um, we're seeing an emergence of uh, collective uh, workplace organizing, not always in the form of union organizing. It's also just, you know, it could be you meeting up with a colleague and saying, hey, I have a grievance. I don't know how to, how to handle this. Can you give me some tips? Can you give me some pointers? Um, the role of worker centers are particularly important. You know, we need to recognize that unions and worker centers are not the same thing. Um, but the right to organize without uh, retaliation is important. Uh, you still see in the news today, um, you know, Starbucks and others are retaliating against employees who attempt to organize within their, their retail shops. And thankfully, the NLRB that we currently have is taking that head on, um, though we need more resources to support to support those efforts. And then um, the last one I'll mention, because I, I don't want to go through all 10, because there are a lot of them, but um, is the right to democracy. You know, given what Seth mentioned, um, the right to participate in democracy as a worker is critical. I don't know, like, who's ever been in a job where you couldn't get off work to go and vote? I mean, none of y'all, y'all are <laughs> nice. Well, I mean, there are a lot, the, I mean, the vast majority of folks who work in hourly positions in particular do not have that option. They can't take off of work to go and participate in democracy. And I feel like that is a very big civil rights issue that also coalesce with our worker justice, worker power issues in this country, too. Um, the labor movement is so essential to uh, the right to have a democracy in this country and is responsible for a lot of the uh, um, the, the many of the rights that we have today in the workplace through electoral organizing and otherwise. So, and I know community change has been a big part of organizing workers and particularly uh, low, wage, low wage workers. So, so yeah, so those are other elements of job quality that I think are, you know, not always centered in the typical definition of job quality beyond just wages, but I wanted to offer that um, and also put a plug in to look out for the official Black Worker Bill of Rights um, coming soon. <laughs> One mic, right? One mic. Right. It's coming down there next. <laughs> okay. So um, I think, Alex, you touched on something that I think is really interesting and really um, important, right? Um, I think full participation in our economy and full participation in our democracy are linked. And I'm curious, this is maybe for both Seth and Angela, how do you think about... Um, how should we think about the impact economic policy has on our democratic institutions? Who wants to go first? Yeah, bring it back down. Yeah, and I, I really appreciate this question because, um, in part, I think you know we we're I think I don't know if you were able to to watch any of the January sixth um, hearings yesterday <laughs> yesterday and over the summer, right? And in part, like it, it, it raises some really significant issues. And there is, in fact, a connection between democratic access and our ability to actually deliver on economic policy, right? And in part, like, as I think about your question on um, specifically on economic policy, I'm thinking more around um, the issue of economic inclusion. Because when we think about black folks, people of color, women, other folks who have often find ourselves at the margins, in essence, like what we're talking about is the ability to participate, the ability to, to access what some of us are able to readily take for granted. And I think one of the things that, um, uh, you know, looking at the January 6th, uh, you know, hearings and the issues that underlie that is just a reminder that there is no change without power, right? We look at the last election, and we think about all the things that could have been if the election went a different way, right? Knowing that some of the things that we absolutely care about have, are st have still not materialized, but it could be much worse. And so I've, I've just got to be really clear that there is no change without power. In community change, we organize on issues of immigration, of worker rights, on child care, and housing. And what we have to be really clear on, while those issues are important, if there is no um, democratic system on which to deliver those issues, then it's all for not, 
right? So for those of us who care about um, economic policy, for those of us who care about other social policies, we have to become literate in power. We have to see that democratic access, democratic inclusion of black folks, of women, people of color more broadly, right? We have to be clear that that, that issue is our issue as well. We can't just keep our head in the sand and say, OK, well, I'm just going to work on workforce issues. Right? Because in part, if there is no democratic vehicle in which to, to deliver that, then the, the, the policies will actually not um, meet its kind of transformative goals. Right? So our, our shift in community change and in with the partner organizations that we work with all across the country is to shift to focus on um, um, protecting our democracy, on expanding inclusion of people of color, knowing that it wasn't perfect before January 6th for black folks, right? And in part, like the struggle for us continues. And the recognition is we have to see that advancing our issues, delivering on child care, expanding Medicaid in Florida and in North Carolina and in um, in in um, in Michigan will only happen if there's a democratic um, uh, uh, mechanism on which to deliver it. So um, ensuring that Black folks aren't excluded from our democracy in, in Michigan and in Virginia and in all those other places around the country is an essential component on how we're able to deliver on the significant policy change that we're so rightly concerned about. Thank you so much, Seth. Uh, they told me this was working. Can people hear me? Yep. OK, so we've been joined by, no, let's say no. <laughs> We've been joined by Natalie Madera Colfield, so I just wanted to take a pause um, so that she could she could join our panel. And Angela, I'm going to come back to you, and I'm going to I'm going to ask Natalie uh, her first question. But Natalie is the former um, the former assistant administrator at the U.S. Small Business Administration, and um, Natalie, we've we've talked a lot about access to good jobs and what jobs mean for, for what good jobs mean for Black folks, but you kind of come at this from a different angle. Um, could you talk to us a little bit about um, entrepreneurship? So like we know entrepreneurship is a is a path to financial well be well being. So what are some of the important policies? that come up for you in terms of supporting black entrepreneurs? And what what have people maybe paid a little bit too much attention to um, that maybe they need to shift away from? Yeah, uh, so first, it's a pleasure to join you on stage with my esteemed panelists. And thank you for having me, pardon my delay. Um, but yeah, so to answer this question. So I served as the highest ranking black woman appointed to the US Small Business Administration during um, a moment in time which I believe SBA probably will never see again. Um, and we deployed more federal resources, more money than the Department of Defense did. It was the largest deployment of funds in the history of SBA. We went from scaling, uh, we went from, you know, engaging with roughly 50,000 small businesses through a network of about 5,000 financial intermediaries to uh, scaling up over the course of nearly six months to empowering and engaging with 11.2 million small businesses across the country. It is unprecedented unprecedented, it was unprecedented, and even if we looked at this paralleled in the private sector, it has not happened. We have not seen a startup bank go from being a bank with 50,000 uh, clients to scaling up within six months to 11.2. So with that being said, right, this was one of the most um, invigorating times to work at SBA because policy, to uh, my colleague's point, policy was being formula formalized, uh, policy was being created, policy was being implemented. And then as that happens, right, we take two lines in statute and it will have a dollar figure associated with it, right? For example, $175 million, which was two sentences in the American Rescue Plan that ended up being a $175 million funded program at the Small Business Administration. And what do you do with those two sentences, which give you a theoretical framework for which to create a program, but they are not the definition of how this program should be run. They are not the definition of how you actually build equity into these programs. It requires people like myself and others who are noble colleagues of mine at SBA to really put the meat behind the legislation. 
But it also, from the other vantage, requires small businesses to be a part of the legislation process. A lot of people didn't see SBA until they needed SBA. And then all of a sudden, everybody needed SBA. And what we realized is, as entrepreneurs, we are uh, and have as instrumental a voice in this as our large corporate partners do. And the reason why is because we represent 90% of the small business community in this country. And so if we don't show up to our local town halls, if we don't show up to our state initiatives, if we don't show up to our federal Congress members, if we need more things like PPP, or we want to challenge the way that PPP has been designed, or the way that PPP was legislated, and it's two or three sentences, then that is where that rubber meets the road in terms of us showing up for ourselves. I can't tell you how many times I would get calls from folks that I got to decline for a PPP, and the reality is SBA didn't decline you. SBA was the guarantor for PPP loan. Your bank declined you. Your financial institution declined you. And so again, having that political relationship, folks would then go talk to their Congress members and ask them to ask that bank or ask us to ask that bank. But this is all a, a part of his point, the democracy of you being an entrepreneur. You don't just get to show up and, and, and be in a space where you're creating products or services that get well into the millions and then not be a part of the legislation that guides and dictates how you're taxed, where your funds go, what write-offs you get, all of those types of things. They're very critical and they're very important. And the last thing I'll say on this too is funding has been deployed and will continue to be deployed to invest in small businesses across the country. Right now, black women are the fastest growing entrepreneurial demographic in this country. I'll say it again. Black women are the fastest growing entrepreneurial demographic in this country. That, that's, worth a, that's worth a clap by, by our women and our men. Women as a whole are the fastest growing demographic across the nation. 80% of black households are economically led by a primary breadwinning single black woman. We can't have economic conversations without the black woman being at the center. At the ne she is the nexus of that conversation. She's not an afterthought. She's not an auxiliary part of this. She's not just a mom. She is the backbone of our communities. And so to you know, my colleague's point about making childcare affordable, giving investment capital to small businesses, and being a part of the legislation that creates and funds these initiatives that are funding $100 million incubator programs that the Minority Business Development Agency. Shout out to Don Cravens, the first ever undersecretary of MBDA at the Department of Commerce, which was also codified in legislation. Why? Because business associations and trade groups went to Congress and said, you need to make this a real agency and stop having them beg for peanuts every time the budget process comes up. Give them their proper due. That's where we as business owners come into play, and then we will see the residuals of that as well. Did I answer your question? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you joined and got right into it. I really appreciate that. Um, I think, Angela, to follow on, there's like a black woman best thing in there, but I'm not going to ask you that question. Um, I'll try I, to weave it in. Oh, all right, all right, all right. All right, so I think I'm talking about economy and democracy, right? Mm -hmm. Are they related? Uh, I think the short answer is, uh, yeah, they're inextricably linked. You know, I mean, to Seth's point, we are, you know, not to alarm anyone, but I think everyone can see the conditions that we're in right now. We are in a moment of rising white supremacy and authoritarianism, authoritarianism in a country that has never known equal rights for black people. Like, we are on the wrong path, right? Like, I think that is fair to say we are, you know, a year out from ins an insurrection that was supported, promoted by a racist demagogue who also happened to be the president. That's, that's a pretty bad situation for us to be in um, as black people and as a country. Um, so the work that Demos does, I get to talk about my real job now, <laughs> um, is, is, is focused on attending to uh, those issues that I raised. So uh, Demos is a think tank. We uh, work across the economy and democracy, um, and we are pursuing 
driving a shift in power toward black and brown communities in order to create, for the first time in our country, a just, inclusive, multiracial democracy and economy. Um, that's pretty challenging, right? Especially given the conditions that we have. But I'll tell you a little bit about how we do that work. Um, so we work across areas. We work in deep partnership with movement groups across the country. We are not organizers, but we work really closely with organizers. We try to provide resources to organizers, policy, um, and we also do litigation um, because we still haven't recognized the promise of the Voting Rights Act that was passed a generation ago. Um, so working across all of those areas, we are deeply focused on trying to build this movement to shift power toward communities that have never had it before. Um, I'll also say this just about our, our economic work. Um, it really is through the lens of how do we bring more democratic participation into our economy. Um, so just as an example, some of the work that we're doing right now um, is focused on promoting economic democracy. So the idea that full participation in our economy uh, requires that we are at the table um, and we are enabled to be at the table um, by this power shift. So uh, some of the things that we are thinking about is uh, promoting models of co-governance, um, expanding the notion of public goods. You know, Alex talked about education as something um, that black people want and can't access because it's so expensive. It is a generational expense that is unnecessary um, and, and that we can afford to expand to more people in this country, but we haven't because our policies um, are exclusionary, and that is because of the limited democracy that we have in this country. So these things are always connected. Um, and then finally, uh, addressing corporate power. As long as we have giants like Amazon and Facebook controlling every kind of aspect of our daily lives, it's sort of startling when you start to think about how uh, deeply they impact both us as consumers, but also us as workers, right? Like Amazon and Walmart and Facebook can set the conditions for the labor market um, that have a huge ripple effect on black workers who work in those companies and outside of them. Um, and so that is another important thing. And then the, the last thing I'll say um, on the corporate power is, is worker voice is an important part of that uh, rebalancing. It's critical to democratic participation, as Seft and Alex both mentioned, um, but it also is crucial to ensuring our economic rights. We have to uh, ensure that uh, workers have a seat at the table, that they have forums to organize, and a lot of the most promising organizing that we've seen across the country is black folks, is brown folks, organizing their workplaces, being out on the front lines uh, of, of really challenging uh, outsized corporate power and a democracy that is hostile to, to us. Um, and then, because I mentioned I would talk about Black Women Invest, um, I, I just want to uh, lift up uh, this point about black women. Uh, this is where we should start our policy making. Uh, one of our colleagues and friends, uh, Janelle jo Jones, uh, coined this term black women best a couple of years ago. Uh, and the theory behind it is if you center black women who historically throughout the history of our country have been the most marginalized, uh, then we'll get policies that benefit everyone. And so it doesn't mean that our policies are exclusionary. It doesn't mean that they will solely benefit black women. But you know, this race neutral that Alex talked about at the beginning is sort of a fallacy. When we have race neutral policies, we have white centered policies. And that's what we've had the entire history of our country. And so I think this is an idea that we, I will say for many of the panelists, I think have already taken into our work. But it does get you to a different set of solutions around what's necessary in our economy and democracy in order to have justice. So much more to talk about there, but uh, I'll turn it back to Jessica. Thank you. And um, we're going to have a little bit of time for Q&A. So if you have a question, get it ready, write it down um, so that we can, we can ask our panelists. But I'm going to ask everyone up here to answer something in just like a minute, maybe 90 seconds, if you can do that. Uh, and we're going to start with Natalie. But what is one key point or policy that our audience should keep in mind as they work to advance economic policy for black communities? Mm. Wow. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, oh gosh, OK, one minute? Oh, I don't know if I. So BBB, Build Back Better was a big platform for our administration. Um, it had hundreds of millions of dollars to invest in entrepreneurship ecosystems, uh, entrepreneurship incubators, entrepreneurs. Um, I would highly recommend any time that you all are seeing these types of policies coming out of agencies and coming out of administrations, regardless of what the, uh, the party is, because we have to play the game in every terrain. 
is that you be present to the economic implications and the distribution of funds to support ecosystems and to support entrepreneurs. We see this with the CHIPS Act as well. So the CHIP Act also provided technology transfer funds to support everything from HBCUs and their assistance with the development of incubators and programs to support STEM-based, uh, manufacturing-based businesses, but also to businesses. We saw that with the President's commitment to invest 15% uh, of federal government contracting spend with small businesses, which means $100 billion is, has been opened as it relates to the floodgates and the size of the pie that small disadvantages businesses have access to. So I think everything has an economic implication, to be honest with you. Even when we saw the Child Care Act come out and billions of dollars, $34 billion invested in child care, my mind went to what can we do to support women around building child care businesses and legitimizing these child care businesses to reap benefits from the distribution of these funds. So I see economics everywhere. All right, and I, I see people everywhere. <laughs> um, I do think, you know, organizing and, by extension, policymaking is, in fact, about people, right? And I do think, in part, when I look at um, the work that we do and many of the conversations that we have to have, oftentimes, like, you know, much of this is being led by black women, right? I look at our black-led network within Community Change. It's primarily black women organizers around the country. And as difficult and as challenging as um, some of the examples that we, we can point to of all the ways in which um, black people are facing violence when we attempt to participate and demand a place at the table. Um, black women haven't given up. Black, pe black people haven't given up on our democracy, right? And I think there's a point of uh, both caution as well as inspiration still connected in that. So despite all the violence, despite the struggle, black people and black women specifically have not given up on this democracy. Despite all the things that we've seen over the last year, black people, black women are still leading, still knocking on doors at this very hour, right? still calling people in to the process despite all the challenges that we have seen. And so I think one of the things that I, I, I have to kind of take from this moment is, is not just, um, you know, it's not just that, that, that um, you know, people in this moment matters, but it's just the recognition that we cannot take that for granted, right? We absolutely cannot take that for granted for granted. We need to create systems wherein we're honoring the contributions of black women, wherein we're honoring the, the, the kind of persistence of black women from not turning away from our democratic systems. And I think we, we are, we're at a place where we have to recognize that we must deliver, though, on the issues for which we're, black women are showing up. Because we know that on issues of pay, on issues of health care, on issues of child care, on all those issues, black people and black women specifically are still demanding things that have not yet been delivered. But I, to your point, Jessica, making it simple, keep um, a focus on people. Oh, give me a lot to follow up on. <laughs> um, so I, I will say, I'll leave with kind of coming from an advocate and a researcher perspective, but um, you know, I, I think every week somebody comes to the, me in the Joint Center and they say, you should, you should support this thing because it's good for black people. My number one response every week is, how do you know? We do not measure anything, hardly anything in this country as it relates to what we propose is actually good for black folks in this country. Um, and I think that has massive implications for the future of how we design our labor policy, economic policy writ large. And I think that is something that folks need to be particularly conscious of whenever they're invited to sit at tables. Whenever it's not enough to just have a sit at the table, you have to actually critique, scrutinize the very reason why you're there. and the majority voice that's at the table, why they're um, advocating for certain things. So I would say, you know, as we're thinking about economic policy, a lot of it's being done um, to black people and not with black people, uh, which begs the question of, well, if you're saying it's good for us, how do you know? Rarely, if ever, will you get an answer, because people do not disaggregate outcomes by race and ethnicity, hardly, if ever, and that's something that I think that we're making a lot of progress on, like Angela mentioned, this whole concept of racial equity, particularly in the federal landscape, is, is new, and there are a lot of gains to be made. That's also a lot of gains that could potentially, potentially be lost, and we have to, like, put, like, full pedal to the metal, holding people accountable and asking them, if you think that a certain proposal is good for black communities, particularly in the economic space, then you have to show us how do you know. So that's, like, the, that's, yeah, that's all I have right now. You only gave me a minute, so. 
Um, I, I'm just going to go back to something that Seth said earlier. It, it all comes down to power. Um, you know, some of what uh, the work that uh, I talked about in the beginning, that Natalie talked about, uh, would not have been possible even a decade ago. It took black women until 2018 to, cover from, to recover from the last economic crisis. Um, we're not where we need to be right now, but things have shifted because people have organized, because black and brown led groups have demanded more, because of the advocacy work that many people in this room have done over the last decade, we're in a different place. It's the reason why we're starting to get somewhere on student debt, even though it's still not enough. It's the reason why there actually was some money for people um, coming out of a huge economic crisis. And so that power shift is essential because we don't get any of these things without that demand for power. And so organizing in workplaces, uh, in communities, uh, to demand uh, that we, we shift power toward the communities who know what we need is the way that we'll get, we'll get anything. And we know that because it's already working. So I know it was a little doom and gloom before, but I think that there's a lot of positive models across the country where we've been able to organize and win economic rights and power. Um, and I'm excited to see uh, more of that bear fruit. Is, is it possible for me to add one yes. thing? I just, you know, I want to I want to share a couple of things that actually matter of factly happen in this administration because uh, I think it's important for us to know. So first, on the president's first day in office, he signed a racial equity executive order. Let's just stop and pause there. We can all go home just from that. Why can we all go home just from that? No other president in the history of the United States of America has done that. Even in the freeing of enslaved Africans, that has not been done. That has been challenged every single federal agency to require themselves to look at the ways in which their program services and offerings for the American public are or are not equitable. And then to publish public reports on this and then to create metrics and frameworks to hold agencies responsible. That's never been been done before. So I mean, I, I want to make sure that we also give kind of due propers when we've, we, when we've achieved certain things. No, we have not achieved the zenith of what we needed to do. No. But we have been making strides. We also invested billions, hundreds of billions of dollars in CDFIs, in black communities, black and brown rural communities across the country, reinvesting and redefining what rural in America looks like. I don't know where everybody in this room is from, but my family's from a little small town in Louisiana called Natchitoches, Louisiana. And when I think about rural, I think about them. I think about that small little black town in Louisiana. I don't just think about uh, what other people are defining rural as and we need to reclaim our own definitions of rural because many of us come from rural places we came from the segregated crops in in the south rural America we didn't all just come from urban communities seeking refuge in opportunities and, and jobs so I think us also being a part of rural American conversations and now we've seen an unprecedented uh, number of black and and communities of color moving into suburban communities so we also are defining the suburban market. So we have to also take ourselves out of exclusively engaging in urban-based conversations and start reclaiming our space and reclaiming our voice and reclaiming our position in spaces like rural and suburban America where economic policies are now being formed that we're not at the table for. And because we don't see, we're collectively using past tense models of who we've been. We're building new markets outside of the market of Atlanta, for example. That's rural America, everybody. Mm -hmm. If you drive 15 minutes outside of DC to Waldorf, you're, you're formerly in rural America. I mean, but you see where I'm going with this? Yep. So I'm, I'm, my challenge to us is the reclamation of our definitions that we're, we're seeing ourselves in, but we're not claiming that we're there. Like, we cannot have to rule what has happened to us with jazz, where we just don't see that that's us anymore. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Everybody still with me? Because when I look at policies, policies are dedicated right now, and they will be in any other administration, including the last one, to supporting rural America. If you don't see yourself as rural, we need to redefine how we're seeing ourselves in those spaces. Absolutely, and I think um, I've had that conversation, that exact conversation with several people over these past uh, 
several hours because that you know the joint center is really focused on black communities black rural communities in the south in particular um we i may get in trouble for this <laughs> oh boy. we're gonna we're gonna allow one question it has to be quick right here in the middle she's coming with the mic i'm sorry i know i said really quick and then i said give it there you go okay. nope they keep giving us mics, the mics don't work. Just pretend you're in church. <laughs> For all of the progress we've made from ARP down to the CHIPS Act, the Inflation Reduction Act, that has set the foundation for engines of growth and opportunity. However, where are we in our um, ability to enforce that we have access to jobs, fair access to secure and safe housing, which is a conversation that's not come up yet, mm. and making sure that we have a democratized access to sort of financial security. The conversation in a room before, automation has made that a lot more tenuous. Our fairness regulatory apparatus is 50 years old. Are we ready to stake our fight? Do we have the tools? How do we pivot to ensure that this elbow room that you guys have fought to create will stay open and continue to grow? I can, I'll just quickly uh, uh, go back to what I mentioned in the beginning about some of the work that uh, my colleagues at DOL um, had been doing around the Good Jobs Initiative. Um, the reason for that was not because we had gotten sort of a lot of money from any of those bills that you mentioned, but because uh, it's really critical that as experts in um, the labor market and labor and workers that we were at the table as those decisions were made. So I think that there's a lot of opportunity and frankly something that an observation that I had um, from my time in federal service is that like, uh, you know, there are real silos across agencies when it comes to uh, uh, comes to the work we do. So it wasn't necessarily that, you know, our colleagues at, you know, EPA or DOE or what have you um, weren't deeply invested in job quality for workers. It was just like that's not their area of expertise is thinking about how to create safe work places, how to ensure that um, wage theft doesn't happen on the job. Um, that's something that we know a little bit about, and so we were able to um, to support them in that way. But, you know, I, I will say that is like something that is not a naturally occurring phenomenon that takes a lot of effort and coordination across administrations, and there's no guarantee that the next administration will, will carry that forward. And so I think that you're raising a really good question about how do we build in that accountability so it doesn't change when the administration changes or the staffing changes in those agencies. Um, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. So just from the financial perspective, so I'm on a coalition, a fintech coalition. What we know um, is that the fintech community has um, been far more diverse in its deployment of, of financial resources to small business owners, and we saw that evidence through the PPP distribution than some of our more historic, larger financial institutions, non-inclusive of our CDFIs. So I think as new uh, fintech businesses are coming up, um, and as new companies who were who were you know probably nascent at 10, 15 years ago, for example, like PayPal, right? In this in this space, that's where again our voices matter and being a part of the corporate conversation as well. The vice president just did an announcement of $300 billion from a range of different foundations, corporate sector partners, and others uh, investing in underrepresented communities. I would go look at that press release and find out every one of the companies that, uh, that said that they were going to sign up for that and schedule a meeting with them, right? So part of this is about them reaching out to you, and the other part of this is about you reaching out to them, right? So nothing is ever going to just show up at your front door. As much as I would love to say that that's the case, it's just never been precedent with anything that we've ever achieved in our lives. And it certainly won't be the precedent for the way the government shows up for you. Uh, Y'all got 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I feel like um, Seth and I might go in the same direction. Um, organizing, right? Like long-term sustained organizing and a long-term sustained investment in grassroots or frontline organizing is key to actually maintaining the changes and making sure that the dollars flow to where we need to need them to go. I mean, um, my brother and I live in Georgia, and uh, we're in the South, and it's a fairly conservative place, but it's also where black folks disproportionately live. Mm -hmm. It's also where a lot of this money is flowing. Mm -hmm. And whenever the Fed say, hey, we actually need like local participation in the design and distribution of these funds, who's on the ground down there saying, we need 
to be at the table. We need to actually draft the, the RFP. Mm -hmm. We need to develop the performance measures, you know, and hold ourselves accountable mm -hmm. to making sure that we're actually engaging community. And um, that's not always the case. Historically, that's not the case. I mean, look at block granting, for example, and how terribly yeah. that's that's turned out. And that's still the, the law of the land that we have here. And this, a lot of these grant programs are, um, you know, maybe following the same trend if we don't build power and actually re require our state representatives to, um, to, to engage our communities meet in a meaningful way, but I'll give you the last word. All right, 30 seconds. <laughs> I'm reclaiming my time. <laughs> yeah, but I, I appreciate this question. I think there's a recognition that all the initiatives that you talked about at the start of that process started out much differently, right? They were much, much larger and got negotiated down through the legislative and administrative, um, you know, process. And so I, I do think, um, you know, as I'm having these conversations with folks, um, like in this room and in, in communities all across, across the country, I think I have to be reminded that we need to really um, you know, focus on what we need, right? What we need, not what we think is possible, right? What we need, but not what we think is possible in recognizing the fact that many of these initiatives look very different mm -hmm. at the start of these processes and with Joe Manchin and others, right, got negotiated down to either not happening yes. or looking to be a fraction of what those legislation really started started out at the, at the top of the process. And again, I'm just going to leave us um, where I started and that there is no change without power. We can, we can um, be interested in whatever issue we want, but if we're not in a position where we're going to build the power that basically kind kind of uh, creates a condition where those initiatives can be made real, then we're just having conversations. No change without power. Uh, thank you all. Um, like, thank y'all for mm -hmm. joining us today. We really appreciate um, your time and your contributions to this conversation. Um, if folks are interested in learning more about the Joint Center's economic policy work, uh, feel free to go to our website. We're at jointcenter.org. Oh, but thank y'all so for joining us. So much good information. I love it.